the Norfolk coast near Cromer. A microlight pilot has total engine failure at 4,000 feet. I was startled and suddenly I'd lost it. He's got little more than a minute to find a safe landing site, but there's a problem. There was a power line running across the field. It was a 3.3 thousand volt cable. Engineer Kevin and his wife Lynn live in the village of North Newbold in East Riding, Yorkshire. They have two grown up sons. We've been married 30 odd years, 37 years or so. Uh, Chris is 32. Uh, Elliot's 22. Lynn and Chris help manage the family run engineering firm, which Kevin set up in 1993. He specialised in mezzanine floors. We do a lot of the retail sector. So we'll put a second floor in the building and double the space. Now, I mean, half semi retired, and the people running the business do a much better job of it than I ever did. Lynn's everything. She really is the star of it. The firm has a real family feel. Employee Mike has been with them for 15 years. Kevin's one of a kind. Um, he knows exactly what he wants to do, and he has his own way of getting there. He's a bit like a, a father figure to me. He's a good guy. Their flaws take their clients up a level. But Kevin's hobby takes him even higher. Flying is a special pleasure. Not a thrill in the thrill-seeking way, but actually a very privilege to look down on lands of cars and roads. And there you are above them all. You can go to the back of a cloud. You can look at your own reflection in that cloud. You can see a rainbow from above. And you can watch England unroll underneath you. Kevin's aircraft of choice is a microlight. And it doesn't just fulfill his passion for flight. It gives him the opportunity to indulge his engineering skills too. He's fitted his own engine to the machine and enjoys trying to improve its performance. I would say he's a little bit obsessed, yes. He's always tinkering with his machines and designing bits of new kit and things. Tinker with engines instead of 11, little go-karts and things. But a microlight is something completely different. It's uh, something that actually flies. It's a dream. And for a working class lad to be able to do it is, I think, incredible. Because the things are affordable. But wife Lynn isn't as keen on the microlight as Kevin. Lynn tolerates the hobby. She decided to go up with me one day uh, to see what it was all about. So when I took her up, she thought, well, this is OK, but it's very slow. And she spent a lot of time looking over the side and saying, look at that house with a swimming pool, look at that house with a swimming pool. <laughs> so, of course, I put it down very quickly and said, oh, yes, you know. <laughs> I didn't want to finish up paying for a swimming pool. Kevin's been flying microlights for 20 years. Apart from a scrape with a tree in the early days, he stayed safe. They aren't in themselves inherently dangerous, it's how you operate them. It's a sunny weekday in April, and Kevin's freed up some flying time. He decides to head down to an airfield 129 miles away, near Cromer in Norfolk, to see a friend who works there. It was a beautiful day, no wind. The journey would take probably two and a half hours. Kevin regularly records his flights with a camera fixed to the top of the plane. It's recording as he takes off and begins the climb. I decided to fly high. Uh, on a warm day, it can get a bit bouncy. So the higher you go, the smoother it is. So I was above light broken cloud. It was absolutely perfect. He climbs to 6,000 feet, travelling at 60 miles an hour for most of the journey. Just sailing along, looking down at the views of Lincolnshire and the shape of the coast, feeling all's right with the world. 3.9 miles from a destination, and I can taste that tea already. He starts his descent dropping down to 4,000 feet. But moments later, he realises something is wrong with the engine. It stopped absolutely dead. I was startled. It had been so reliable in the past, and suddenly I'd lost it. I knew it was something serious. I looked back, there was no stream of oil or smoke coming out, so I was in no immediate danger, because it glides safely or she wouldn't catch me anywhere near it. But although the small aircraft is able to glide, it can't maintain height without the engine. Whether he likes it or not, Kevin's going down. He starts to look for a suitable landing site. There were plenty of fields, all available to land on. He considers his options. 
the engine pack a few times while I've been developing it. And I was so complacent, I was actually looking for a field with an entrance next to it, so I could conveniently package the thing into a van and take it home. Feeling confident he can deal with the situation, he rules out one field near a farmhouse, then another that's near a road because the shrubs either side are too tall. Another field has too many crops and yet another looks too rough. I've rejected all the best places to land. But his options are running out. The onboard camera shows how low he is. He needs to make a decision quickly. He spots some grassland just out of camera shot to his left. But he's made a terrible error. I was preparing to land rather slowly. But there's something in the way. It was a 3.3 thousand volt cable. Just off to his left, he can see the pylons. If he hits them, he'll be electrocuted. The impact was going to be a problem, but running to power lines would have been a bigger one. He smashes into the ground at 60 miles an hour. The camera picks up the power line seconds before the crash. He just misses them coming down in soft, boggy mud. The aircraft stops dead, flipping upside down. I don't remember the impact at all. Kevin's body harness stops him being thrown from the microlight, but he's left hanging upside down. Opening my eyes after the crash, I was winded, but I can remember standing up from the machine. The sense of relief after you climb out something like that is enormous. Obviously, you check yourself up and down, and I couldn't believe that I was not, not a mark. After looking back at the machine, that I'd got away with it without a scratch. The microlight is smashed and mangled. I'd fared far better off than the machine. The footrest was bent forward by my feet bracing against it. I'd also bent various tubes with my arms. I'm not that strong, but by gum, you find some strength to hold yourself back. You know, I count myself very, very lucky indeed. And as luck would have it, Mike from the office happens to be at a business meeting nearby in Great Yarmouth. A quick call and he comes to the boss's rescue. I was expecting possibly broken arm, maybe a bit of internal bleeding, that kind of thing, but he seemed pretty, pretty good shape considering what had happened. The pair drive home and the next day Kevin goes back to collect the wreckage of his plane. It was a big disappointment to see the machine destroyed, but that had achieved an awful lot with it. And when he reviews the footage, he realises just how much danger he was in. I'm probably 50 to 100 feet above the trees. That bush was bigger than I expected. As I came in to land, that's when you see the power lines. Oops, I need to put it down firmly. The fortunate thing is the track rolled forward. So in other words, the energy uh, went into tipping the track over rather than a dead stop, which would have been fatal. Kevin briefly considered giving up flying, but decided he would miss it. I wasn't ready to pack in just yet. I didn't want to end it on a failure. I wanted to end it as a success. He's now fixed the engine and bought a new microlight body, but he's a lot more cautious. I'm extremely lucky not to suffer the consequences that I could have suffered from my bad choices. That really was a close call in that, having made all those mistakes, I still got away with it. And uh, that, that's a shout lesson learned. You're never too old to learn. Never too old to learn. <laughs>